Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Chatham House Online. I'm thrilled to welcome you today to this briefing on the Zapad 2021 strategic exercises between Russia and Belarus and of great concern for the West and NATO in general. Um, this briefing will be followed by a Q&A, so you can ask your question through the chat function and you can also use the raise hand and I will then uh, welcome you to uh, ask your question live and my colleagues Anna and Adam will un unmute you and uh, mute you back again. This event is on the record, it will be recorded and released after the meeting uh, on social media and all the platforms that we know and love. Uh, without further ado, let us directly start the uh, discussion. So in terms of the policy questions, you've probably all seen the blurb and the invitation. So we're going to be discussing the geopolitical context of the Zapad exercise, what is expected in terms of the strategic messaging, the scenario, the deployment size, and so on. Also, what is Russia trying to communicate this year uh, with Belarus and beyond? And what does the Zapad mean in terms of military deployments? What should we be looking at and into in terms of military capabilities, hardware, and so on, as well as what should our international attention be focusing on uh, this year? Okay, so in terms of the geopolitics, let me just remind you, this is a Russian military exercise. So it is less about the geopolitical uh, context. It is less about the propaganda and the messaging and more about the military value for Russia and the Russian armed forces. So don't over amplify what it means for NATO, what it means for the West, how much of a threat it is. This is very much Russia and the Russian armed forces looking in and on themselves. Um, it's about military training, less about politics. That said, we have this year, as usual, a unique context. With Belarus more specifically, because of the developments for the past uh, months in Belarus, and also because of all these discussions concerning uh, this strategic partnership and this five-year plan that Russia and Belarus have signed between their militaries, and also concerning all these discussions uh, concerning permanent basing in Belarus. Russia has obtained the opening of three joint military training centers, including one in Grodno in Belarus, where a lot of things will be taking place in the future, and notably the training of pilots on Suhoi 30 warplanes. So Russia didn't really get a permanent posting, but they definitely got what they wanted in terms of increased military uh, exposure in Belarus. So instead of having a rotational presence uh, in a permanent basing, they will have increased, um, in increased uh, staging and positioning of force in Belarus itself. So mission accomplished for Russia in that context. Um, the exercise this year is really about uh, the importance of the union states between Russia and Belarus, especially considering the latest developments in the country, but also re-enshrining the, the importance of this union state and further to this about the CSTO and the military importance of the CSTO. Deal. Um, something to be very weary of is what I call the what stays behind logic. And these were all the discussions during the part 2017, for instance, of did Russia leave or did they not leave anything on Belarus territory after the exercise? Uh, so it'll be interesting to watch both the signaling about how Russia redeploys its forces back to, to Russia after staging them in Belarus, or if anything stays behind. And I'm specifically talking about prepositioning of force, notably in terms of basing, ammunition, fuel storages, uh, and, and so on. Not directly troops, but the kit and gear that, uh, that, that further these, uh, these troops in terms of prepositioning of force. And uh, it's also interesting to look at Belarus in terms of the rhetoric and how uh, Lukashenko has gone from not really willing to participate back in 2017 to being more, one of the most boastful in a way about how important this exercise is uh, uh, in terms of the intimidation that it represents against the West, that Russia and Belarus stand really together uh, in this exercise this year. When it comes to US and NATO in terms of the strategic deterrence and signaling, so how, however Russia wants to present the exercise as defensive in nature, quote unquote, it really is about war gaming. Uh, war against NATO, right? It is about signaling the ability of Russia to move fast and well across a strategic dimension that is close to Russia's eastern borders, um, to, to, to Russia's eastern border and to NATO, to NATO's borders. So it really is about uh, intentions and it really is about signaling 
Russia's ability to uh, to wage war at the operational strategic level in the Western strategic dimension against a peer or near peer competitor who is more technologically advanced. Screams NATO, but it, it isn't really said as such uh, once again. So it's important to look at what is Russia doing specifically when it comes to command and control, when it comes to um, troop displacement and military logistics, but I'll be coming back to this a bit later. This exercise comes in the context of recent statements by Russian diplomats and specifically related to uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Ryabkov's comments that the US is an adversary of uh, Russia. So this is also a very loaded uh, very loaded context, specifically when you look at Russian uh, developments in military affairs and in military thinking about, about all these discussions around active defense, about uh, demonstrations of readiness, about Trojan horses, and about strategi strategies of limited action, but I will come back to it uh, as well. And also a unique context because of the prepositioning of force in the central military district that took place in March and April 2021, and also the HMS Defender uh, June 2021 events in the Black Sea. Um, related to Ukraine, all the prepositioning of force and hardware that took place across the central military district uh, close to uh, Voronezh is also something to be deeply concerned about and something that I will, I will discuss uh, in more details a bit later. So in terms of the military background, uh, Zapad takes place every four years as part of a rotational cycle of strategic military exercises, and they are really about waging war. It is about war fighting operations and streamlining command and control and forces into combined arm operations, joint operations at the operational strategic level. So that means regional war fighting. This is not a local conflict. This is not an armed struggle. This is really about regional war fighting with the possibility to go up to large scale war at the regional level with nuclear deterrence at the strategic level, specifically because the pods always end with a nuclear check and nuclear posture check, uh, which gives the possibility of degenerating from regional war more to a large scale war at the strategic level. So it is very much about large scale joint operations, high level command and control, and uh, across multiple branches of the Russian military. What we observe generally and what we get excited about is what I call the hot phase, which is basically this moment of time when the President Putin looks at stuff blowing up on military ranges uh, for a week that gets our attention. This will take place between the 10th to the 16th of September this year, but the part is larger than this. It is about a three month military exercise with a lot of checks, a lot of pre-checks, a lot of preparations and deployments, and a lot of post-op and post, um, post exercise lessons learned and incorporation into military doctrine and into standards of operation. So what we see is what we get, but what we see is only this sort of hot phase that gets our attention because this is the live fire events and this is when stuff uh, blows on, on, on training ranges. But it's what is not publicized as much, what is beyond the active phase of the drill that is of most importance because this is about how it is done and it is also about what is learned from it for the Russian military. So this is the hot phase, Putin looking at stuff. In terms of numbers, um, so, let us not fall for Zafat scare, right? Every year, we, we always get sidetracked by the numbers, numbers, numbers. Lack of transparency about the number of troops deployed and kits and gear deployed is policy. It has nothing to do about transparency. There will not be any respect of the OSCE Vienna documents on the number of troops deployed, but this is part of policy. Don't expect the part to be transparent in terms of numbers, but don't really focus on numbers too much. It's not always about size, it's what you do with it, right? So let us look at the part 2021 compared to the other ones. It will be larger than 2017 and it will be larger than 2013 for several reasons. The first reason is that the Western military district is larger. It has acquired six new divisions since 2017. So it is de facto a larger unit. Um, there was a lot of prepositioning of force, more specifically uh, in Voronezh between uh, March and April 2021, specifically for the 30, 41st sorry, Combined Armed Armies in the Central Military District that got a lot of kit and gear preposition in support for, uh, for Zapad. So it's not just about the Western Military District, it is also about how another military district, the central one, can reinforce 
uh, can reinforce war fighting capabilities for the main military district engage. There will be more focus on command and control, so necessarily more massing of force. And there will be more presence de facto in Belarus, because we are talking about four to five training ranges and training grounds in Belarus out of the 14 uh, training ranges. So a larger part of the exercise this year will take place in Belarus, specifically the first phase of the plan. I'll come back to it. And also because there were some prepositioning of force and more uh, troops posted in Kaliningrad with the reestablishment of the 18th Guards Motorized Infantry Division uh, recently. So more troops around, once again, the training ranges. Um, 500 troops will be deployed from CSTO countries and SCO uh, members. I'm thinking about India and Kazakhstan, who will represent the bulk of this uh, foreign expeditionary force. And Russia also called up about 18,000 reservists to take part to take part of Zapad, which is, as usual, uh, Zapad always has a reserve component that is not really publicized, but is also interestingly uh, interesting to watch and to follow in terms of how civilian and reserve are incorporated into warfighting capabilities uh, at the combined arm level. An interesting thing is the role in place of China. Uh, as you know, China was officially invited to take part in the exercise, but officially decided to skip um, the part 2021. In a way, for all the good reasons, because um, China being present so close to NATO's borders in a way would have fueled a lot of unwanted attention about Chinese military power so close to, to Western borders. It's a slippery slope, especially because a lot of the exercise takes place in Belarus and China does not want to be seen as supporting Belarus or siding too close to the current leadership. So in a way, they didn't want to get in that time, but what they got in, in August was their own Zapad Interaction 2021 military exercise, which was a, an exercise that took place uh, in Northeast Asia um, about a very classic Shanghai cooperation organization uh, military exercise in a way in terms of the scenario to protect regional security against a terrorist threat, which is very SCO in spirit, and tested greater uh, interconnectivity of command and control uh, in joint formations between Russia and China. So something quite uh, quite close to Zapad, not really Zapad, and without sending the wrong signals. So my main key takeaway on that is don't focus too much on the numbers, but look mostly at what they do with it. Us focusing on numbers is definitely part of Russia's reflexive control to have our attention diverted away from what matters. It's not the numbers, it's how credible you are deploying these numbers, sustaining them, and then using them for warfighting capabilities. So don't fall on scaremongering, don't fall on rumors that Russia is deploying this or that. It's really about what you do with them, and it's about avoiding this form of reflexive control. Otherwise, this might lead to self-deterrence in the West and limiting our options in responding to these deployments in the first place. In terms of the scenario, as usual, Russia sells it as super defensive in nature. It's never about uh, waging war. It's about defending against, uh, against an aggression. As usual, uh, Zapad will take place across two phases. The first one, for the first three days, will uh, look at an offensive from the West, basically uh, understand NATO, and how the Union State of Russia and Belarus will defend against it. This, place, this will take place mostly across the training ranges in Belarus themselves to try to organize defense and counter-offensive against this aggression, quote unquote, from uh, a Western alliance of states. And then the second phase, which will take place across the next four days of the exercise, is counteroffensive in nature from the Union states. It's about striking back, destroying the enemy, escalation control, and restoration of territorial integrity. And this will take place mostly in Russia itself. So both from this defensive and counteroffensive phase, you go from local war to regional war, basically from the operational to the operational strategic levels with the ability and the possibility in the end to raise the ante up to strategic uh, level with nuclear deterrence, as uh, is always the case. The scenario will be very close to, uh, to the part 2020, to 2017 in terms of the states, uh, basically a northern group of states, which is uh, Russia and Belarus and some parts of um, of, of both countries against a Western group of states, uh, basically uh, the Baltic states, Poland, and the Nordic states, 
who are, of course, siding with international terrorist organizations, because that's what we do in the West. But it's basically to show you uh, in this scenario that you go from local war with the support of unconventional forces with these international terrorist organizations to a more uh, strate uh, operational strategic level fighting state on state um, in terms of, uh, of, of, of military uh, war fighting capabilities. Um, so defensive to counter offensive, very classic uh, in terms of scenario. Uh, what is interesting to look at this here is if we take for granted the presence of these terrorist organizations, understand it as code for uh, color revolutions and attempts from the United States and NATO to raise fifth column protests, to raise uh, internal, internal struggle, to try to um, challenge current leadership of the union state. This is really about this Trojan horse logic that Gerasimov presented in 2019 concerning the presence of the soft power color revolution elements that could try to sap the authority of Russia and Belarus from within because of the presence of these, uh, these sub-conventional uh, threats and these sub-threshold threats. So what I would argue is that the part really is about sh Russia showing us how we would counter these foreign elements, how we would counter a Trojan horse coming to undermine the, uh, the credibility and the leadership of Russia and Belarus. So it is very much honed about this active defense strategy and this preemptive neutralization of threats that the Russian military doctrine seems to be informed with uh, and that the military thinkers have been discussing for the past few years in terms of the strategy of limited action, which is basically the importance of the uh, initial period of war about preemptive neutralization of threats that might be coming from within and about readiness of troops. And this is exactly what we will be looking at at the part 2021. It really is about how command and control and support systems are increasing their readiness and their war fighting capabilities at the initial period of war to preempt any threats coming from within or from abroad and to push the tension away from Russian borders as much as possible. So there's a lot that, uh, that NATO and the West should look into when it comes to the deployment of these command and control capabilities and how Russia is thinking uh, the strategy of limited action and preemption of threats uh, in the first place. And as I said, the part will, will probably end with a usual uh, use of nuclear weapons uh, for a launch from strategic bombers to test strategic uh, level war fighting capabilities and escalation from regional to theater war. Um, so, however Russia wants to sell it in terms of the defensive nature of the part, it really is about, once again, war fighting NATO and NATO uh, interoperable forces at the operational strategic level in terms of conventional and unconventional forces. Which uh, leads me to what we should be looking into in terms of command and control, right, in terms of the integration and uh, of Russian forces their ability to mobilize, to generate force, to deploy across the Western strategic dimension, to be reinforced by the, uh, the Belarus forces and the central military districts, as well as other elements of the Russian military, but also how uh, Russia and Belarus are able to generate what they call the regional combat grouping of force, which is the equivalent of this counter-offensive phase uh, or this, this offensive phase that will take place in the first last days, in the four last days, sorry, of the part. Um, that go beyond the response to this initial threat, but really about generation of this regional combat grouping of force that will put the situation back to status quo ante and back to where, how it was. Um, and this really is about once again preempting, uh, preempting this NATO threat and uh, realizing the, the strategy of limited action. It is about Russia proving they're able to move well and to move fast across the strategic dimension and also testing the lessons from Syria, from Ukraine and other deployments recently in terms of integration inside command and control. Basically testing the effectiveness of recent changes in the organization of force in terms of training as well and about best practices learned from actual battlefields for the past few years. Um, an important part that I want to raise your attention on is the prepositioning of force and military logistics. The part is mostly about logistics. It's not just about stuff blowing on ranges. It really is about the ability of the Russian armed forces to move across railway, across airlifts and so on and vertical mobility across this vast strategic dimension in the West and is specifically about sustaining operations for several months because once again, the part takes place across several months 
basically at the level of how do you manage fuel? How do you manage food? How do you manage ammo and batteries? How do you manage your rail network under strain and so on? So this is really about how Russia sustains a potential war effort beyond the initial period of war and beyond, uh, beyond the, uh, ori the original uh, organization of force. Because this exercise will put, put a huge stress on the transportation and the rail uh, network in Russia, as well as on airlifts. So it really is about sustaining the war efforts. When it comes to prepositioning of force, this has a lot to do with this preemptive uh, neutralization of threats and the strategy of limited action. It is about stress testing the armed forces of, for, stri for strategic mobility and military logistics once again. Russia's military doctrine is very much informed these days uh, on concerning storage and prepositioning of force, about prepositioning equipment in key points or in key nodes or doing airlifts and airdrops in advance. Uh, Syria was a good example for this. In Belarus, for instance, with Grodno was a good example. And it is about the peacetime organization of force to increase combat readiness and also to uh, facilitate production surges in the military industry, should they need to restock or rebuild um, beyond the, the initial period of war. Um, this pre-storage pre of equipment and pre-positioning of force only means that Russia is trying to push any fight away from the Russian border as much as possible and beyond the Russian territory at the initial period of war, and therefore growing the area they can deny access to, which is also part of Russia's strategy in terms of, uh, in terms of A to AD and creating these sort of domes of, uh, of uh, anti-access and area denial. Um, and this is also informing a lot of military procurement when it comes to furthering this logic of prepositioning of, uh, of force. And this is exactly what we saw in Crimea and what we saw in Voronezh in, in, in March and April 2021 uh, concerning this, uh, furthering this strategy. So what will they be testing uh, in, in the first place? General preparedness, of course, combat readiness, and so on. Integration of, of, of new military hardware, interoperability with the Belarus forces. There will be a lot of things going on at the tactical combined operations, specifically how ground forces can operate with aerospace forces, the VKS, but also how they blend in with airborne assault units, the VDV, in terms of conventional uh, war fighting, as well as uh, a lot of emphasis on air superiority, a lot of emphasis on air support as well, from frontline aviation, from jet fighters, as well as attack helicopters. Um, a lot of uh, emphasis as well on air defense capabilities and how the multi-layer network of air defense capabilities is operating at the command and control level. Uh, joint naval operations as well, specifically air support uh, from the uh, aerospace forces and the VDV, as well as anti-submarine warfare, uh, warfare capabilities, sorry. Expect a lot uh, of military um, exercise concerning the tactical enablers of the Russian forces, thinking about drones and counter uh, drone capabilities, electronic countermeasures and electronic warfare counter countermeasures, as well as uh, further integration of these systems inside the command and control systems of Russia. Uh, more specifically, uh, real-time data transmission. Um, something that is interesting to look at is what Gerasimov mentioned as unconventional methods and the testing of unconventional thinking during the pod. So there might be a bit more mission command and operational creativeness coming from the lower level and the tactical level for troops uh, in a less scripted scenario. The reason why we haven't had such a detailed scenario for the 2021 compared to 17 or 13 is probably because there will be a lot going on in terms of unconventional response to unconventional scenarios. So probably more unconventional solutions more mission command at the tactical level to create a space for errors and to create a space for denial uh, if anything happens be, uh, during the exercise in terms of should anything go wrong how do we respond to unconventional solutions to uh, and and how do we how do we have more creativity and be less static in terms of uh, in terms of command and control so both testing the c2 but also giving more space for mission command which will be interesting to watch in terms of troops and hardware themselves, and this will be one of my last points, uh, Belarus and Russia promised a complex aerial situation with probably a lot of emphasis once again on air defense, on integration of UAVs and counter UAV capabilities, uh, a lot of electromagnetic warfare capabilities, uh, the greater use probably of these uh, recon, recon strike and recon fire contours. 
specifically integrate their integration inside the command and control system. Um, there will be a naval component, specifically with the Baltic fleet, but also the Northern fleet, which will be which will be mobilized in the European high north, specifically for the the, def the defense of the uh, Kola Peninsula and the Russian interest in the Arctic. And uh, concerning these unconventional solutions, a lot of covert deployments of force and uh, a lot of uh, deployments of the VDV, the special forces and so on, as well as conventional fighting capabilities at the battalion tactical uh, level for uh, assault teams, for instance, or testing urban, more urban warfare capabilities that have been already tested in Syria. Um, Another interesting point will be military logistics to look into engineering support, sappers, and so on. There's always a lot going on in terms of river crossings, engineering work, uh, clearing obstacles, and so on, mining and demining operations, and the testing of CBR and troops. So this will also further Russia's logic of moving fast and well in a strategic direction by placing and pre-placing military logistics at the right level and engineering so that the, the soldiers can do basically do their job. So in conclusion, in conscious of time, um, once again, don't focus too much on numbers, focus on the, don't focus too much as well on the messaging and the geopolitical significance. Look more at the military value for Russia, what they learn and what they learn how to do against the West in a way, because this is once again, not really defensive, but really much about us and about how to war fight, war fight against NATO. Um, and, the other point is that the ex this exercise is not just about warfighting, it is about sustaining operational strategic level warfighting capabilities. Um, so not just about how you deploy, but how you sustain this deployment across vast distances and across a long time. Um, and all of this will inform the upcoming Russian military doctrine that we will uh, be expecting at some point in the coming months, that is a long time coming. But all these things will definitely be included beyond the scope of the, scope of the pad as well, um, in terms of the lessons learned in recent operational deployments. So I will stop there and I look forward to your questions. Once again, feel free to uh, raise them through the chat function or directly by raising hands and my colleagues will uh, unmute you. Thank you very much. All right, question. Um, Anais, yeah, good question. Thank you. Expect a new military doctrine of Russia and all the union state, right? So that's that's a good question. Uh, well, listen, this 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 five year plan that Russia and Belarus signed a few months ago, um, in terms of the, the sort of strategic partnership for mid the military, is interesting. And I, I I would argue that yes, there will definitely be some more integration uh, in terms of command and control, in terms of force integration in general, but. I, th I think Russia's military doctrine is too specific to be furthering a union state uh, logic, especially at this stage and with all the upheavals taking place in Belarus. I, d I don't think there will be, maybe there will, could be a sort of secret addendum or secret clause inside of it that would further Russia's presence uh, in terms of integration of the, the, the Belarus military industrial complex or, um, or even in terms of uh, positioning of force and so on, but I don't think um, that there would be the direct mention of the Union states beyond what is already known, right? Because th there's already so much that has been happening for the past uh, the past few months. Also, uh, Russia already owns, in a way, the air defense network of the of the country and has been uh, um, operating this this uh, Russia Belarus grouping of force since 1999, uh, and that is already included. Uh, inside the Union state. So I, I, I don't see how this could, this could play out in terms of, of pushing for more specifically because of the floating situation in Belarus, but that would definitely be a stronger signal uh, for, for both countries, absolutely. Um, we have a question uh, on how close to EU borders will the exercise be taking place? Well, it will be directly at the EU, EU borders because the Western military district is uh, basically at the border with all the countries that Russia will be rehearsing against if you look at this Western grouping of states. So basically Baltic states, Poland, um, and uh, further south, I'm counting Ukraine, as an ally of NATO uh, and, and, and of, the, of the European Union, so very close to the borders. Um, so once again, nothing to worry, quote unquote, about in terms of Russia invading or reinvading said countries, but definitely a lot of pressure and a lot more pressure 
uh, around these countries, which is fueling this logic about miscalculation, right? So far, Belarus and Russia have been sending the right messages and have been sending the right notices, uh, no towns and so on to uh, the relevant authorities in terms of positioning a force, in terms of what parts of the airspace will be closed, about what training ranges will be used, where and when, but there's always opacity. There's always a lot of lack of transparency on these exercises. So this is increasing the cost of miscalculation, of course. This is increasing the cost of potential tactical errors from happening. And uh, th this will definitely be uh, a lot of pressure during these uh, tension during this, this, this week um, uh, between, between Russia and Belarus. But um, the, uh, the, the bottom line is, yes, it is very close to, to EU borders, it is very close to NATO borders. But this, is, uh, this will require a lot of restraint uh, from us in terms of not falling victim to the scaremongering uh, once again. Um, we have a question on uh, the activities. Do you think the activities on the border between Belarus and Latvia, Lithuania, Poland with illegal migration is connected with the part 2021 or is it just a convenience? Um, so, right, so that, that's an interesting point concerning illegal migration. So if you look at the presence of reservists, for instance, if you look at the presence of FSB troops uh, during the, S the exercise, uh, Rosgvardia, the Russian National Guard, and FSB troops have said they would stand ready to aid Belarus, for instance, uh, if anything happens in Belarus. Um, understand if there is any, any, any sense of a Trojan horse or a color revolution with elements potentially coming uh, from, uh, from sub-threshold sub or sub, uh, sub-national um, troops or elements, then yes, there, there could definitely be um, the, the presence of this sort of like this, this yeah, illegal migration component. But once again, this is about Russia training and retraining operational strategic war fighting capabilities. This is not about illegal migration. It might be used as messaging, it might be used as an excuse to signal um, things with Belarus, but this is very much about Russia in and on its armed forces and in and on themselves. Don't over exploit or over uh, sort of hype the geopolitical messaging behind these things. If they, if they bring so much publicity, it's also because we give it so much publicity. If you look at all the other strategic exercises taking place every year, whether it's center, whether it's Kafkaz and so on, they bring naturally less attention. I, I wouldn't be doing a Vostok uh, briefing, for instance, but since it's so close to, the, to our borders, since it's so close to our perception of the threat, then of course it is bringing more attention. So. I don't think there is need to put everything inside, you know, this magic box of Russia uh, is doing stuff on the pod and then try to, to overinterpret and overhype the thing. Once again, look at the military value of it, not just, you know, not, not just the subthreshold threshold uh, messaging behind it. Uh, so there was an, another question on the issue of migrants uh, linked, to, uh, linked to Belarus. So I think I've, uh, I've, I've covered that as well. Uh, but it's definitely an interesting, uh, an interesting point. I, I, I take it, you know, not, not as face value, but I take it as important. Interestingly enough, the, uh, the Rosgardia did their own, uh, their own exercise, the Zaslon drill, uh, a few weeks ago, which uh, had a sort of um, counter color revolution scenario, which was about uh, this, this sort of Trojan horse coming from within, uh, or this, this, this threat coming from within, this fifth column, and how the Rosgardia, together with FSB troops, could try to push back uh, and and take back control against uh, against these uh, against these elements. So that definitely is uh, a sub threshold uh, sub threshold element to it. Um, another question concerning the complex aerial situation: uh, What should we expect? And to what extent is a part a new milestone in Russia Belarus military integration? Right. So concerning this this complex um, aerial situation, so we we, we don't have um, all the details concerning these things, but uh, what what they what they sold us is basically a multi layered, uh, multi tiered approach to air defense. Um, how is air defense integrated from uh, all the levels from um, of the Russian armed forces, from precision guided munitions to UAV integration inside the kill chain and counter UAV and counter electronic warfare capabilities with an emphasis of joint operations from ground to air and uh, operations with the VEDEVE as well in terms of expeditionary force, airlifts and vertical mobility. So 
there will be a lot of things going on in the air compared to 2017, where a lot more things happened on the ground. Uh, this is also because Russia has understood the nature of warfare is changing, and it's not just about uh, not just about ground forces, but uh, there's this sort of integration from ground to space uh, with cyber in the middle. So I think this this complex aerial situation will reflect this logic that what happens on the ground also has a lot to do with what happens in space in terms of uh, satellites and so on, in terms of um, air force mobility, in terms of electromagnetic warfare, as well as the cyber component. So a very complex approach uh, to, uh, to this situation, this complex aerial situation. And also maybe the, um, may, maybe the presence of these, a uh, few of these super weapons uh, of Putin super weapons uh, at the strategic operational level, specifically uh, the Kinzhal or the Zircon system, that might also be displayed as a short, sort of shock and awe on the one end that these systems are working, but also a sort of show and tell that well, if you're interested in buying these systems, then we can we can potentially provide uh, provide you with uh, with a discount. So um, the uh, that that's the logic in terms of this complex aerial situation. Um, and thank you for your question. Uh, lack of transparency means risk of military incidents, of course, and that's one of the main risks uh, during these exercises is that there is so much going on and there is a lot of expectations on both sides that everything goes well, that uh, there is always the risk for tactical errors. And that's one of the main problems that we have at this stage today uh, when it comes to uh, Russia management in a way, specifically during these exercises, is mass miscalculation management. How do we um, how do we avoid incidents? How do we avoid unprofessional military behavior from degenerating into uh, into uh, hostility or degenerating into more tension? So, as these exercises are scripted, and as they take place into very restricted military polygons or training ranges, there is less potentially actually less tension than uh, in other moments of peacetime deterrence when Russia is conducting a lot of unprofessional military behavior across the board, uh, whether it is in the Baltic Sea or in the Black Sea or in, uh, in the Nordic, uh, against the Nordic countries. These exercises are not there to up the ante or risk any military incidents, but right, that's the beauty of it, or that's the danger of it. You can never know for sure. And you can, uh, you can always expect some hot-headed pilots, for instance, from going a bit beyond the script or taking operational freedom or mission command a bit too seriously, and um, which, which could risk uh, and put more pressure on, on NATO and its allies. This calls for more restraint on our end. And we should also understand that this is a military exercise. This is a drill. This is not a Russia war fighting uh, for real, in a way, and this this is also this 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 very minute distinction between what is intended and what is unintended, what is pur purposeful military escalation because there is a lot of signaling going on, and what is an incident or an accident. So we will definitely need to be extremely cautious when it comes to whatever happens uh, during the exercises. There's always some mishaps. I mean, for the, ever since the dawn of Zapad, the there's always been some mishaps, some things not happening the way they should military hardware falling, uh, explosions going on where they're not supposed to do. You might remember in 2017 when a missile uh, shot really close to a bunch of journalists uh, on a polygon uh, in, in 2017. So there is definitely a lot of miscalculation and incidents happening on the training ranges themselves. So something to, uh, to look into. Um, question, Vitaly Dmitrov, thank you for your question. Um, what do you think uh, about the common threats for the West and Ukraine uh, after the drills in Belarus this year and in occupied Crimea later? Um, so listen, that's, that's a really good question. I think this relates also to uh, this, this logic of what stays behind and uh, will Russia leave th more things than necessary uh, after they, they, they retreat from, from Belarus uh, after the end of the exercise and after the end of the hot phase. So if you look at the pattern in, um, in, in Voronezh, for instance, with the central military district and how much kit and gear was left uh, in, the, in the Poganova training range for the 31st uh, combined armed armies, uh, when Russia said they would, uh, they would disband and they would go back to their garrisons and they would send back the kit and gear. Well, actually, it's not the case. A lot of things have stayed behind, uh, close to Ukraine borders and, and, and in occupied Crimea. So there is always this 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 problem and this um, these these weak signals about prepositioning of force that could stay in Belarus after 
uh, the military exercise. And this comes back to what I was saying. What is it that they're leaving? If it's troops, then it might be that they will be moved away afterwards, or they might be here for training and so on, or from the, the return of experience in the, in the post Zapad environment. If it is, you know, fuel, if it is ammo, if it is modular basing and so on, then it's a bit more problematic because this, this screams prepositioning of force. This means um, peacetime organization of force and military logistics that has nothing to do uh, about a real military exercise. So th this will definitely be uh, something to look at in terms of the beyond the weak signals. This is definitely a strong, uh, a strong signal, but something to look at um, uh, to beyond the exercise and, and, and what it represents and what it means uh, beyond that for the West. Um, what uh, would be the new Kremlin's doctrine in connection with the Black Sea region about? Um, so I think it's a bit beyond the uh, uh, it's a bit beyond the uh, the exercise, but uh, let, let's let's discuss that over coffee, neutral. <laughs> um, concerning the hardware that Russia is selling to Belarus, including another question concerning the S four hundred air defense uh, systems. Uh, and the announcement of greater military interaction. Um, yeah, so that's the logic that Russia is only selling S-400s to their friends, except when they're enemies. So the, uh, the S-400 really is about this logic of further integrating uh, in great pomp and with great messaging, uh, the Russian, the, the Belarus um, military infrastructure into the Russian one. Uh, the military industry is already very integrated. The air defense network is already fully integrated into Russia's, and there's uh, the joint uh, the joint regional air defense system that is operated. The S-400s are part of this logic. They're not for Belarus, they're for Russia, let's face it. I mean, Russia positioning S-400s there is also signaling that they own the sky and they own the, uh, the, the, the air protective domes uh, inside of Belarus, which is also reinforcing uh, whatever is happening in the Western military district and also what is happening north in the uh, in the OS Kasevir, the northern military district, but also reinforcing capabilities in Kaliningrad, which have all, all, already been reinforced for the past few months. Um, so there definitely is uh, a lot of signaling there that it's it's not just about Belarus. It's the, about the further integration of a stronger, more ready air defense network that happens to be in Belarus, but is fully integrated uh, regionally with Russia. So uh, something that is that, that NATO should take very seriously and that we should take very seriously in terms of what it means in terms of access to a contested environment and what it means for the further layering of these military capabilities. Because it's not just about the HES-400s, it's about the multi-layered uh, systems that they put together when it comes to counter-drone warfare, for instance, electromagnetic and counter uh, countermeasures in the electromagnetic spectrum, um, as well as this multi-tiered, multi-layered system uh, from long range to coastal defense, basically, that we should be very uh, weary about. Um, what should we be looking for in terms of information warfare? Very good question, Tony. Thank you. Well, we're into it, right? This briefing really is about information warfare and how do we understand signaling from Russia in terms of, uh, of the message itself of um, of, um, of Zapad. So expect a lot of disinformation going on from the Russia, the Russia sphere and the Russian propaganda sphere in terms of Zapad really is about defense. Zapad really is about uh, the, the spirit of the Union States and it, it really is about uh, integrating both forces and it, it is less about NATO and it is less about uh, the West, which is true. Once again, you know, I, I will stand my ground saying that it's more about the military value than the geopolitical messaging, but this is how we, how we exploit it and how we interpret it ourselves. The logic is that any, any um, over-focus or over-hype on numbers will be over exploited back by the Russian propaganda machine uh, to divert our attention away from it. If the West wants to, uh, to focus on numbers, so be it, it's fine. It's actually what we want them to, right? It's the little box that Russia wants to put us in and that the leadership wants to see us in, which is focusing about, you know, the 200,000 men deployed and women deployed on uh, during the part, not about what we do, what we do with it. Uh, so definitely part of this information warfare uh, logic. Um, in Anais, thank you. In 2017, Belarus insisted on inviting Western observers, uh, much to Russia's discontent. What is the situation now? Uh, good question. So Russia officially uh, invited uh, observers for, to, to come. So far, the call has been answered officially by uh, friendlies 
basically the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization countries, uh, the CSTO as well, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, and further to being observers, the, the deployment of troops from Armenia, from India, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, uh, Pakistan, you name it. So um, this, this has a lot to do as well with uh, Rosa Baron export using the exercise as a sort of show and tell uh, show and tell moments to uh, further defense contracts and uh, military contracts uh, at the end of the line. So concerning um, observers, this, this is part of this shift of rhetoric that Belarus has, has done um, in, in 2017, because if, if, if you remember, Back in 2017, Lukashenko was extremely reluctant concerning messaging around the part. And this, this call for international observers was almost sort of a pity call to say, come and help me, because um, I, I fear, you know, I fear the threat from Russia coming in. Now it's actually the opposite, that we don't need the West. It really is about us and the union state of Russia and Belarus. It really is about these brazen, bombastic statements and this intimidation uh, that the more Russian troops there are, the more protection I feel as Lukashenko um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of survival of, of, of my regime, uh, quote unquote. So it is less about the West in this logic and less about the, the presence of Western observers than it is about uh, furthering the spirit of the Union state and then showing that the exercise take place not just between Russia and Belarus, but also be, with the friendlies, right? With the SCO, with the CSTO, with a very special place for China with this Zapad interaction, uh, August military exercise. So a, a bit different in terms of the rhetor rhetoric this year. Um, Tracy, thanks for your question. Uh, you mentioned the Russian focus on sustaining operations over several months. How successful have they been in terms of improving sustainability in recent years? Uh, great question. So in, in terms of sustaining the, the war effort, so you have to distinguish between Russia's understanding of what they call the initial period of war, which is this, um, this tipping point of, of, the, of the conflict um, which is a revamp of a Soviet doctrine from the 70s and 80s when Russia, when the Soviets were looking at this tipping point of a conflict, when the conflict actually breaks out, we actually have an idiom in English for that, um, and the ability of the, of the Soviet back then and now the Russian forces of achieving operational objectives at the earliest hours and days of the campaign, uh, understanding that they cannot sustain several operational fronts at the same time for more than two weeks, three weeks, let's say, depending on the size of the deployments, and that Russia's strategy requires operational surprise. It requires um, what Dima Adamski calls cross-domain coercion to seize the initiative. It really is about furthering these gray zone operations and understanding the nature of non-kinetic edges uh, to, to seize operational control, shock and awe the enemy and establish a fait accompli at someone's border and then go back to status quo sante. So, Considering unfavorable conditions, because Russia, the Russian military planners and the military elite believe that they are in, in sort of a conventional inferiority compared to NATO and, 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 and peer competitors, uh, military advanced competitors, then it really is about seizing the initiative, using these tactical enablers to seize, uh, to, to create operational surprise and, um, and, and, and use prepositioned forces and military equipment to, to, to do this shock and awe cross-domain coercion logic uh, by seizing the initiative. So this is, this is really about the initial period of war. And then beyond that comes sustainability, right? It's the ability of Russia to do a sort of quick in, quick stop at the initial period of war and make sure that what, whatever is sustainable is done according to what they can do because the ability of Russia to move and reinforce several strategic directions is highly limited. There was some, uh, some fascinating research done by RAND uh, recently on the ability of Russia to move uh, across several strategic dimensions and their sustainability of, uh, of military operations. And this is really about uh, what you can salvage in terms of sustaining a, a war effort. Beyond the initial period of war, it really is about quick in, quick stop, if you will. And, 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 and making sure that if you need to go beyond that, if you need to move beyond this threshold of the initial period of war, then you do it with enough knowledge and enough force to choose your battles and avoid retreating, uh, retreating uh, too early. So that, that is definitely a lot of improvement uh, in terms of sustainability. The um, state armament program of, 20, of um, of, of 2027, uh, 2017, sorry, is actually 
uh, has actually earmarked a lot of money for this prepositioning of force. What they called the um, what they called the um, storage or something like re refurbishment of storage uh, or, or something. There's a specific category inside the GPV and the subsequent state defense orders concerning uh, peacetime organization of force, basically, which is really owned to this initial period of war logic and the sustainability of the war efforts. And sustainability also has a lot to do with the military industry and about the ability of the Russian military industry to go into surge capabilities and surge production uh, should they need to um, quickly go into uh, repair works, quickly go into producing uh, amounts of uh, large amounts of military kits and gear um, that they have to do uh, to sustain a potential war effort. So this is creating a lot of problems for the military industry, and but this is beyond the scope of, uh, of, of this conversation, but it, it really falls into the same category of prepositioning uh, and peacetime organization of force uh, inside, you know, in a holistic way inside the uh, inside the military industry. Um, question on uh, potential nuclear escalation, could you elaborate? Uh, and how would they simulate in practice uh, for something like this? Good question. So yeah, but basically, um, every Zapad ends with a simulated um, nuclear uh, deterrent exercise at the strategic level. So once again, the possibility for Zapad to go from a regional operational strategic level uh, war fighting to large scale uh, theater warfare at the strategic level in terms of nuclear deterrence. So usually it is it is a readiness check of the nuclear armed forces and the Western military district and other district, how they interoperate, and also about simulating generally a, uh, a nuclear launch from strategic bombers or the deployment of strategic bombers to reinforce uh, the military uh, deployments of Zapad. Um, this always take, takes place after the hot phase, so a few days after, or simultaneously with the last days of the hot phase, and uh, will be uh, carries on for a few days, and then is reincorporated inside lessons learned uh, for the for the for the military. So I would argue this will take place again, um, and and that we should be uh, we should be looking uh, into this as well. It's not just about conventional forces; there is definitely always a, a nuclear component. Um, Question on how are they going to train combat against Trojan horses inside Belarus? And is this part of the exercise? Good question. So the, the logic is for Trojan horses is that since there will be an, imp an impetus on uh, special forces, on VDV, the air assault units, on uh, Spitsnaz and so on, that could be able to very quickly um, neutralize and identify and then neutralize the, these international terrorist organizations that the, the in the scenario the Western alliance of states uh, might be deploying against the Union state of, of, of Russia and Belarus. Um, they, they could be the, this, this rehearsal of a scenario whereby detachments from Belarus and Russia have identified some potential um, Trojan horses or this fifth column civilian or even um, even little little green or little whatever men uh, coming from uh, from abroad or from within because they decided to take up arms and challenge the leadership of the country, which looks very much like what's happening in Belarus, for instance, in terms of street protest and how they would be identified and then terminated uh, and to go back to the status quo ante and how from this this might degenerate into actual states waging war against uh, against the union state. So. Since uh, the FS Ben Rosgardia have said they would be on uh, on standby to use as a reserve force to aid Belarus uh, in case of a, of a sort of color revolution against the country, I think we should expect a scenario where we have more presence of these troops, more reservists, and civilian uh, civilian military integration to counter uh, to counter a potential Trojan horse threat altogether uh, intermeshed with uh, greater intelligence capabilities in terms of collection and then treatment of signals uh, of intelligence from Belarus and then from Russia. Um, another question on will Zapad possibly impact Russian extraterritorial military deployments? So that's a, that's a great question because a, lo a lot has to do with these, uh, these lessons learned uh, recently from, uh, from operational deployments in Syria and Ukraine. So you can expect Zapad to, to, to be uh, a test of these lessons learned 
whether it's Syria, Ukraine, or even Libya recently, and the integration, the greater integration of uh, contractors and private military forces um, with the Russian forces. And I think that's the crux of the matter in terms of how Russia is thinking its extra, uh, its extraterritorial activities and how it is thinking it's sort of far abroad uh, reassertion through military use. And um, how these lessons learned are integrated inside the command and control is one part. The second part is really about the sort of contractor military integration, contractor military uh, links that uh, that we've seen developed for the past few years and have exploded completely uh, in, in, in certain parts of Africa, for instance, in Libya more specifically, but also in Syria. Um, so this will definitely inform this sort of integration, but also inform the future uh, Russian military doctrine at this stage in terms of what is Russia able to afford in terms of extraterritorial military deployments and what is what is possible uh, in terms of um, of the trigger and the threshold for response and taking risks. This is a multi this is a multi tiered logic right, but the more you integrate and the more you operate with. Uh, these private military companies, and the more you actually give the Russian military these, these tactical enablers to, 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 um, to, to create more space for deniability of, of intervention, more space for covert deployments, then I would argue this lowers the threshold for risk taking and lowers the threshold for potential warfare specifically when it comes to foreign military deployments and, and lowering the threshold of how much it costs um, the Russian military or contractors to intervene in the, in the conflict. So definitely uh, definitely something to, um, to, to look into. Um, I think, well, there's a follow-up question. Thank you, uh, merci Ev. Um, are P PMCs such as the Wagner Group integrated into the Zapad exercises? Um, not that I've seen. Uh, but among these reservist uh, forces, um, you could definitely have, since we're thinking about unconventional solutions and unconventional thinking, you could definitely have the integration of uh, these private military companies and contractor groups inside the, the reserve force or inside the unconventional forces deployed during the plan. I have not checked, I must admit, or have not seen anything related to this, but that's a great question, definitely something to, uh, to work on, I would argue. Um, and final question, Anais, is, is Ukraine part of the Western group of state um, in this scenario. So the uh, if we come back to the um, to the, the the scenario for this year, um, you have three notional uh, notional groups of the, the Western group. You have um, the Baltic states, Poland, and the Nordic states. So Ukraine is not uh, integrated in the Western group of state. But interestingly enough, Parts of Ukraine are actually placed inside this northern group of states, which is the Central Federation, Russia and Belarus, understand the, un the Union states, and what they call the Republic of Polesia, of Polesia, which is a historical region between uh, the border between Belarus, Ukraine, and Poland, um, which I did uh, I did show on the map. I'll be happy to circulate the. Um, the uh, the PowerPoint, as you can see uh, on this map, you have this 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 old sort of historical construct of Polesia between you, parts of Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland, which is technically part of the good guys, as per Russia, right? And in, in, in terms of the Russian Belarus Union state. So interestingly enough, Ukraine is integrated inside the uh, inside the Russia's warfighting capabilities and not uh, and, and not considered the enemy, quote unquote, during the exercise. So pretty interesting in terms of the signal it sends on how Russia sees its um, its margin, its borders uh, for this exercise and what it will mean militarily speaking. Um, it's been an hour and I'm conscious of time and I don't want to uh, take too much of your time. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your presence today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the briefing. I know I've had great fun answering to your amazing questions uh, today. Um, this is the first event this month of the Russian Eurasia program. We'll have plenty more to attend, so check your inbox, 
check the Chatham House website and please do check the link that Anna has just posted in the chat function with all our, uh, our upcoming events. We're also starting to organize hybrid in-person events, feels like 2019, so please check them out. We'll be partying 2019 again and welcoming you back to Chatham House physically um, in this in this sort of a uh, pre post COVID situation. Um, thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you for your presence. Have a great week. And I look forward to seeing you soon virtually and or physically, hopefully, um, at Chatham House or beyond. Thank you very much and stay safe.